Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, good to be here with you today. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5. That's where we're going to be preaching from today. We're going to preach again on the Holy Spirit. A couple of weeks ago, we preached on the Holy Spirit on Wednesday night, and we'll kind of review those thoughts a little bit and lead us into today's message. Galatians 5, before we get started, we want to ask God's blessing on the Word. Father, we bow before you today, Lord, and we just ask you to please help us, Lord, to preach the Word. We pray, God, that uh, we would learn, Lord, the things that you would have for each one of us here today. God, guide our hearts, break our hearts, lift us up, correct us, whatever it is that we need. And Lord, most of all, if there be one here today that is unsaved, God, may the Word, may the Spirit draw them to salvation. We ask it all in Jesus' name, and amen. So we're going to preach on the Spirit today, and I must confess that I feel that's probably one of my worst topics to preach on because I, I feel like I'm still really learning myself, and I don't know if anyone can really preach on the Spirit the way they want to because there's probably a lot that you can't put into human words and tell someone. It's things you have to learn on your own. They're, they're things that happen on the inside of an individual. But we want to do our best to look at what the Word of God tells us today concerning the Spirit of God. Now, a couple of weeks ago we preached on the Holy Spirit. And we did that out of the book of 1 Kings. We talked about Elijah. And in that message, one of the points we wanted to make was, many times I have said, and we will always say this, that faith is, is greater than emotion. And it, it always will be. Um, sometimes our emotion matches our faith. And that's great when it does, but sometimes they don't. So you always got to pick faith over emotion. And many times faith can override your emotions eventually, and your emotions will meet up somewhere with your faith. Maybe not exactly where you <laughs> want it to be, but faith is the, the key thing there. But we also said during that message, we don't want to, to forget that God made us to be emotional beings. We are emotional beings. We get sad, we get happy, we get angry, all of those things. And the Spirit will use those things sometimes. Sometimes it is just the, the small feeling of joy in the soul deep down. There are moments, however, where it manifests itself greatly and outwardly. Maybe it's manifested for you like that in a church service. Maybe you were in your car or in your home Maybe you were on your riding mower, as I have been many times. When the Spirit of God overtakes you and the emotion comes just pouring out of you. We talked about that when we looked at Elijah. And we went and we looked at Elijah on the day that he called down fire from heaven. If, that was ever, if there was ever a day where the Spirit of God aligned with the emotion of man to an absolutely amazing moment, it was certainly there. I mean, I've never called down fire. I don't know how about you. And he stood up against 400 prophets, over 400 prophets of Baal. Um, he, he stood there and he, throughout the day he mocked them. His faith was rock solid. He didn't just have the faith that God was going to send the fire down when he prayed. He knew God was going to send down the fire when he prayed. And I liken that to those moments that we have where the Spirit really grabs a hold of our emotions and makes it pour out in an amazing, wonderful way. But something to remember that we said in that message is that's not every day. It's not every day. That moment in Elijah's life was just one day out of many days. And we only have a few chapters in the Bible Concerning Elijah's life. We don't even have all of it. Elijah's life wasn't like that every day. As a matter of fact, in a probably less than 12 hours, we go to a man on a mountain calling down fire to a man hiding, saying, God, take my life. It's enough. Human emotions are like that. Human emotions can be up on top of the mountain, and they can be down in the lowest valleys in just a matter of moments. But we don't live, and we're not meant to live at the highest highs every day. 
nor are we meant to live at the lowest lows every day. So where are we meant to live at most of the time? Well, if you remember the story, the Bible tells us that God came and he comforted Elijah, gave Elijah food and told him to rest. Sometimes we need that in our lives when we're down like Elijah was. We just, we need rest. And then God said, I'm going to pass by. And you're going to hear my voice. And so, and, and I'm just paraphrasing all this. I'm not reading exactly. So the Bible says that Elijah went and there was a great wind. Such a powerful wind that the rocks and the mountains were rent. And it says God was not in that wind. Then it says that there was a fire. But God was not in that fire. There was many powerful things that happened. But God was in none of them. And then finally it says this. A still small voice. And we talked about that on that night. And we talked about how that that's where we live most of the time. A still, small voice that we have to learn to listen to. Now, someone might ask, I've got that, i got you. What does that still voice say? Well, that's what we want to talk about today. We want to learn to differentiate between listening to the flesh, because there's two competing voices in our lives. There's two competing voices within each one of us. The flesh that will always be there and will tempt you, and the Spirit. The flesh will always speak louder than the Spirit. Most of the time. And we'll, we'll see that in this message today. But we want to learn, what is the language of the still small voice? What, how do I know as I'm learning to listen to the Holy Spirit, how will I know what I'm feeling? How will I know how I'm supposed to act? How will, how will I know? We'll, we're, we're going to hopefully find out some of that today. So in Galatians chapter 5, and starting in the 19th verse, the Bible says this. Now the works of the flesh. Now keep that phrase in mind, because it's going to mean something a little more here in a little bit. The works of the flesh. In other words, these are the, this is what the flesh does. This is what the flesh wants to do. This is what the flesh desires to do. This is what the flesh will tempt you with. And this is what Satan will use the flesh to tempt you with. Now we're going to read a list of, of sin and temptation here. And as we read this list, no doubt we will each see our old life in this list, and we will probably see things we struggle with in our present Christian life, if you're saved. This is what the flesh will try to do. It says the works of the flesh are manifest, or in other words, they're, they're plainly seen. They're, they're open to the human eye. This is what Satan and the flesh wants you to do. Which are these? And he starts out, and he names off first adultery. Now that's pretty obvious to us, but you know, it's amazing to me that I've heard stories throughout the years. Um, one story I can remember in, in particular of a pastor getting too close to the secretary of the church. They had a full, they had full-time positions at this church, paid positions, and eventually the pastor said that God wanted him to leave his wife, the secretary to leave her husband, and them two to get married. I can assure you, God never wanted that. The flesh will make leaving your spouse look like a good thing to do. Everything the flesh does is always something that is enticing, but yet in the end it always hurts us and hurts people around us. Adultery is obviously one of those things. Fornication, sexual acts outside of marriage. Um, the world today is, is bombarded by such things. And it's, to the world's eyes, it's, it's silly today for someone to say, no, I'm waiting until I get married. But that's the godly thing to do. That's the right thing to do. That is the thing that if you do, you will be happy that you did that. But sexual sin and and temptation is absolutely at every corner, 
at every corner. You can't turn on television. You can't get on social media. You can't really do anything without that temptation being there. And it's, it's running wild in the world today. But the flesh will tempt you with that. Um, as we go on down through here, it says the works of the flesh is, is uh, uncleanness. And what's interesting about that word uncleanness, it, it means in a moral sense, and it can also mean in a physical sense. Now, uh, I'm sure that this is probably just speaking of all around uncleanness in a moral sense, but I'm going to tell you something funny. I have been on ambulance calls where I'm pretty sure people, the way they smelled was a sin. It was bad. <laughs> I promise you, it was bad. Uh, but... These things, just, just being a, a not good moral person, not good on the inside. Uh, the works of the flesh continue. Lasciviousness. In other words, uh, lasciviousness is not saying no. It's, it's giving in to unbridled lust. Just taking the, the chains off. And we see that certainly in our society today. We see how perverse and evil man can get. I've told you stories like this before, and I've seen another one this week. A professional counselor for people with mental illness. She is licensed. I'm saying all that to show you how scary this is. Released a video saying we should not call pedophiles, pedophiles anymore because of the negative connotations that come with that. We should call them minor attractive persons. That's someone with a license. And here's what's even more sad. There's people that support that and will support her. Unbridled, listen, sin will twist, everyone is twisted in a different way because of the fall of man. Every single one of us is. <clears throat> But to get to a point where we just turn the reins loose and say whatever is fine, whatever is okay, that is what lasciviousness is. And, and we see that in our world and we, we see it in, in people's lives. Idolatry. Um, we talked about that uh, uh, briefly in our Sunday school lesson today. We don't see it so much in the sense that there are the false gods that they serve, those have kind of been hidden by Satan. But all, all the sins that involve all of that are still the same. They don't know they're worshiping Satan. And what is happening in today's world and why we see such a turning away from the things of God is because people want to make themselves God in their life. This is the... We are called as a creation to humble ourselves under the name of Christ and under our Heavenly Father, and to do what they say to do. But the world today says, no, I don't want to do that. And, and I'll give you an example I seen a couple weeks ago. Every now and then I listen to this guy. You can either listen to his podcast or he has videos on Facebook. Frank Turek, he's an apologist. He goes and he presents um, what we would call just simple secular evidence that the Bible is... Is true that the Bible you, is trustworthy, and he will take questions after. And he asked one fellow, at least I'll give this guy this credit. At least this guy was honest enough, or at least this guy was 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 honest. Frank Turek asked him. He said, "If I could, without question, though, and this was the point Frank Turek was getting at. This guy is a non-believer because he wants to be a non-believer, not because there is not enough evidence." He asked the guy, if I could give you exactly what you needed to prove that the Bible's true, to prove there's a God in heaven, that Jesus Christ is his son, would you become a Christian? The guy said, no, I probably wouldn't. He wants to be the God of his own life. We see that today. Witchcraft. Um, that there is a rise in the occult. But what is interesting about this word, witchcraft, as it moves to... Our English language is this is the word we get our English word pharmaceutical or pharmacology from. Drug use. All of that goes tied hand in hand. I have seen people on methamphetamine that look demon possessed. And I can't help but wonder if perhaps they aren't. 
there, there are things that you open yourself up to. Um, and, and so I, I don't think it's by accident, I don't think it's by coincidence that the Old English is witchcraft and that same word we get our word pharmaceutical and pharmacology from. We, we see that today. The, the, the flesh will drive a person to, uh, to drink, we'll see in a little bit, to use drugs. The flesh will drive because, let's be honest, life can be difficult sometimes, can it? I mean, life in general just can be difficult. And if, if you don't know the Lord, what hope do you really have? And you want something to lift you up. And so many people turn to that because the world is getting darker and darker. Moving on. Hatred. If, if you want to know, you know, the feelings I have in my heart, are they from God or are they from the flesh? Well, uh, is it hatred? If it is hatred, then no, it's, it's not from the Lord. Um, we, we continue to go on down through here. The word variance, it means to be a, a contentious type person. Um, you know, am I listening to the still small voice? Well, are you, a, are you a contentious person? Do you want strife? Do you always cause quarreling? You know, there, I've, I've said this before, there's some people in life that ain't happy unless there's some kind of a, a problem or a conflict. Are you a, a can, do you like problems? Do you, do you like that kind of stuff? If you do, you're listening to the flesh. If you want contention, if you want strife, if you always want there to be a problem, you're listening to the flesh when those things come along. Um, it goes on to, to speak of seditions. This would be a person that causes divisions. Are you a divisive person? You know, the, that's the work of the flesh. You know, the work of the flesh, just for a, a quick example. Someone will go and talk about this person to that person. And then after they're done there, they'll talk about that person to this person. And, and just causes division rather than harmony. Heresies, someone who does away with truth. Whether it be biblical or obvious truth. We see obvious truth being done away with in, in our day. Uh, envyings, are we an envious person? You know, that, that can be something that's very difficult to work past. Um, especially if you and the same per and you and another person have the same goal and are in the same place, and perhaps maybe they're doing a little better than you at something, that can be something that is hard to work past because you have to humble yourself not to be envious. The flesh will tell you to be envious. The the flesh, j just for a quick example, uh, I, I could I could spar someone in jujitsu and maybe they get me in the match. Well, what is my response? Man, they stink. They ain't no good. Well, they just got me. But isn't that a lot of times people's responses when they get beat? Well, they ain't no good. What's up with them? They know, why'd they get picked? Why'd they get picked? You know, or, or do we congratulate and do we just move on ahead? Murderers, obviously. Drunkenness. Uh, revelings. Revelings is big, huge parties and, and everything that goes with that. So all these things it says are the workings or the works of the flesh. We see all the nastiness involved in this. We see, it, it, as you read it, it just makes you not feel good on the inside. This is what the flesh will do if we listen to the flesh, if we listen to the old nature. And the apostle goes on to say this. He says, and such like of the which I tell you before as I have told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now let me stop right there and, and, and add on or, or speak on that for just a moment. When he says they that do such things, he is talking about people who live in and practice these things. As we began this message in, in this portion, we said that without a doubt, we're going to see things that we probably currently struggle with. I don't need to know what your struggles are. You don't need to know what mine are. But probably somewhere on this list, we see something that the flesh entices us with. Even though we don't want to, yet there's part of us that wants to and wants to give in. That is being saved. Fighting against that, with that struggle. But just a quick word of caution. People who perhaps say they're saved, but can live 
in and doing these things and are never bothered, there's a, a major problem there. I mean, if, if I can do these things and not be troubled by them, there's a spiritual issue in my life. The Bible tells us, in the Word of God, it tells us that the Father will chastise us. In other words, we will struggle. We will be miserable. If we live in the flesh, there will be a misery and a difficulty within us without question. God is trying to wake us up. God is trying to say, listen, to the because listen, the flesh will, will scream these things. It will scream these things. And someone that lives in, in these things, um, there, there's some major issues if you're not convicted by these things. So now we move on to the good part of the message. This is the fun part. But it says, but the fruit... <coughs> Of the Spirit. Now notice the difference straight off the bat from the beginning of the 19th verse to the beginning of the 22nd verse. The works of the flesh. But then it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I like my job, uh, and there are runs that I'm thankful that I've been on. But my job is still just that it's a job. Um, I had runs in the past 24 hours when I got off this morning, runs that I was, I was happy to have helped people, I was happy to have been on, and I also had runs that I uh, questioned my career decision at times. Um, that's because it's work, right? I mean, if we had the, the choice to choose between doing our favorite hobby and getting paid well to do that or going to our job, which one would we probably pick? Probably pick our hobby, the things that we enjoy doing but don't get paid for. That's why we do them, because we enjoy them. Work is just that it's work. And the flesh and what it does is like work. It produces things that, you know, you get off a 24-hour shift or, you know, whatever hours you work at your job. I don't care what kind of job you have. If you take your job seriously, you're tired when you get off work. That's just the way it is. You're tired when you get off work, whether mentally, whether physically, whatever the case might be. Work is like that. It takes something out of you. The works of the flesh always take out of us. It always takes out of those around us. It always steals joy and happiness. It will give temporary happiness for a little bit because there is pleasure in sin for a season, but that pleasure always goes away. But the fruit of the Spirit, I thought about that and I thought, you know, work is work. Nobody generally likes work. Everybody likes some kind of type of fruit. Fruit is sweet. It's pleasant. It's pleasant to the eyes. It's pleasant to the nose. It's pleasant to the, to the taste buds. And not only that, fruit has within it things that, that vitamins that are essential to the human body. In other words, things that, that help us on the inside. Um, you guys know my weight loss journey. I was eating just meat for a very, very long time. And finally I got to a place where weight loss slowed down and my performance in, in the gym and different things was, was going down too. So I started adding a little bit of good stuff back in, in my diet, fruit and um, whole grain bread. And uh, I did that because uh, here recently, a week or two ago, it, we sparred at jiu-jitsu and taekwondo, and I was just absolutely, I had no gas in the gas tank. And uh, I added this back in, and next time I sparred, man, I just, I had energy to keep going and going and going and going. There was something I was, I got to a point that I ended up missing it. I ended up needing it. And fruit does that. It, it adds what we need on the inside. The Spirit does that. The fruit of the Spirit. This is what the Spirit produces. You don't work for this. The Spirit produces it. But you must, you must listen. Now, a quick note. And I'm going to try to not hold you a lot longer. A quick note about this. We're going to read a list of what the Spirit of God wants to produce in us. And I do not believe this list is a haphazardly given list. I think there's an order to the way the Spirit of God gave this list to Paul to write. 
First off, though, there must be faith above everything. We must believe. I didn't say feel. We must believe that God is everything His Word says He is. Because without that, forget about the fruit of the Spirit. It won't happen. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that without faith it is impossible to please Him. Faith is the keys and the ignition of the vehicle. Imagine this silly story right quick if you would. Imagine you had a brand new automobile, whatever automobile you want, whatever car you want, truck, SUV, van, whatever. Imagine you got that, but you knew nothing about vehicles. You knew nothing about them. You knew nothing about the combustible gas engine or the electric engine. You knew nothing about that stuff. You didn't know about a key. You didn't know of whether it's a push start key or a key you put in the ignition and turn. You knew nothing about that. You just knew you had this beautiful vehicle. Well, the vehicle, though, ended up becoming a burden because to go anywhere or to take the vehicle anywhere, you had to push it. Now, it sounds silly, doesn't it? Because that's so much work to push this vehicle. Imagine if it's a big truck or a big van to try to push it. When you get to the top of a hill, it'd be great because you can coast down. But eventually, you've got to push it back up a hill. Living the Christian life without faith in the Word of God about who God and His Son is, is like having a vehicle without knowing how to start it, not knowing how the engine works. Because faith is the activator of the Spirit. When our faith is separated from our emotions, if our emotions are bad, if our faith is separated from that, and our faith says, no, this is what the Word of God says, then that, that ignites the Spirit. And when the Spirit is ignited, what fruit does it want to produce? What does the still, small voice say to us to let it have in our life? Because remember, there's two competing voices. The first off is love. The Spirit wants to produce love. Love for the Lord first and foremost, obviously, but love for everyone around. Let love reign. Joy. Joy deep down in the soul. There can be a joy in the soul even when life is falling apart. You say, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is there can be a joy knowing what our hope is before us. Knowing what we are going to get to have one day. A joy because as faith is placed in these things, we understand these things are real, they're tangible, they're solid. And that can produce a joy within us that we are meant to have. God wants to produce these things. Peace. Do you have peace? We're meant to have peace. I mentioned this Wednesday night, I believe it was, and preaching on a completely different subject, but we talked about how there's the, the talk of nuclear Armageddon and all this and that. I don't know how long that talk's been going on. Um, it's happened within the last two or three weeks, but I can assure you I'm just as tore up about it as I was a year ago when they wasn't talking about it. There's a peace that I have in the soul. God is in control of everything. My days are numbered by my Heavenly Father. Not by anyone in Russia. Not by anyone in North Korea. Not by anyone in this country. God knows when my time is coming. God knows how my time will get here. So there is a peace in my soul because I know the Master's in control. Long-suffering, patience. The fruit of the Spirit will produce a patience in us for other people. That's important in a church. You say, why is that important in a church? Because we're also very different. We're also very different. And believe it or not, there'll probably be times we'll get on each other's nerves. I know, that's shocking. That's shocking. What is nerves? <laughs> but that's just how it is in a group of people. But you see, when there's love, and then there's joy, and there's peace, and then there's patience, you see how this is... It first stems from faith, and then it goes to love. 
And then love to joy. And then joy to peace. And then peace to, to long-suffering, patience, endurance for other people. Gentleness. Just being a, a gentle person. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to produce within us. Many times I think men probably have more problems with this than women. Because we, we think, oh, I can't be gentle. That's not, that's not good. But Jesus was gentle. It's going to tell us about meekness here in a little while. Jesus was meek. And Jesus could raise the dead. So if he had that kind of power and he was gentle and meek, I don't deserve to have my pride and ego lifted up so I can look tough or anything like that. Gentleness. Goodness. As goodness comes, notice next, faith. So I thought you said faith was at the beginning. This is more faith. Faith is the activator. And as we listen to the Spirit, I'm trying to hurry, I know we've been a while. As we listen to the Spirit, as these things are produced, you know what else is produced? More faith is produced. Jesus said these words. He says, To him that hath not what he hath shall be taken away. In other words, what he's speaking there in that parable, he's speaking of someone who didn't use their faith. What they have will be taken away. He says, but him that hath, more shall be given. They're exercising it. They're using it. God wants to build your faith. Meekness. You know, I, I thought about this, and again, this speaks to guys. I guess it could probably speak to women too. A lot of times, you know, we, we want to not let anyone have the last word, or we want to not let anyone think they've uh, done anything to us and we want to think we're tough and this and that. The, the toughest man I know that I've seen with my own two eyes is, is Phil Clark. But he's the most friendliest, down-to-earth fellow I've ever met. Um, he's gentle and he's meek also. Um, we are called to be meek. Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. I'm not called to put myself out there. I'm, I'm called to put the Lord out there. Temperance, controlling ourselves, getting a hold of those things. The Bible says this, against such there is no law. I, I've stated many times, um, I, I, I wish I knew how to preach on listening to the Holy Spirit better than I do. But hopefully this message helped you. It, it's difficult to to learn all of those things. But that still small voice, love, joy, all, all of those things, peace, long-suffering, those are the things that the still small voice will tell you to allow and produce. He produces it. And it's so much better than the things that the flesh will try to produce. Um, I don't know if we have anyone here today that is lost, but listen, it's said there, as we stand today, it's said there that the works of the flesh, the book of Romans, in the sixth chapter, the end of that chapter, tells us this, the wages of sin is death. You work to the flesh, you sin, the payday is death. But the gift of God, it says, is, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't know if the Lord's been speaking to anyone here today and you know you need to be saved. But if you do, we pray that you'll come and put your faith in Jesus and come and ask God to forgive you. Um, with every head bowed and every eye closed just for a few moments today. Is there one today that would like to come and would like to pray?